Oh, it did say something about this will not be recorded on StreamYard. So I'm hoping that it's recorded on YouTube because that's the way I set it up. Fingers crossed that's actually going to happen. <laughs> oh, I can see that now. There's a viewers count, live viewers in the top left. And oh, that's, yeah. But but that's a that's a YouTube counter, not a LinkedIn counter, so we won't actually know. Oh yeah, and I don't have that. Oh, you don't? Okay. Mm -mm. All right. So uh, for the possibility that folks are joining us at this time, what we'll say is uh, just so that people can find the link click in, log in, et cetera. We're gonna give just about 45 more seconds to allow for that to happen and they will get rolling. We are gonna jump right in <laughs> and go for it. So stick with us for just another 30-ish uh, seconds and then we'll get, we'll get rolling. And good morning to those uh, of you that it's morning. Toss that in there. <laughs> <laughs> or afternoon. Could there you go, thank you. Where we are, yeah, depending on where in the world. Thank yeah. you for filling that in, yes. And we're watching the recorded version of this while jogging on a treadmill. All right, we're at 10.01, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, switch us over to the presentation view, which should also include us, hopefully. We'll play this from the start. Does that look the way we wanted it to look? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so here we go. We are gonna jump right in. Um, appreciate everyone being here, checking out this content. Uh, I, I believe in this content very deeply. Uh, the idea of helping to helping the world to transition to a new model of business, that being a model that's driven by purpose is really a passion for me. I know it's a passion for Kirsty as well. So having the opportunity to share this information with you guys is quite rewarding for both of us. Any other opening comments? <laughs> I'm Kirsty Tricoyan. You've all met Colt. Um, I'm going to ask you to go ahead as we go through this. If you have comments or questions, please put them in the comments section. Mm -hmm. We'll get to them as we come to the end. We think we're going to wait until we get to the end to answer them. But that's a place to chat with us and ask questions so that we can come back to them as we go through. So, Colt, you're going to get us started. <laughs> All right, here we go. So uh, the first thing is I really want to make sure that uh, for those folks who are joining us from a business context that you know, we really understand the intent here is to address the core business challenges of our modern day, right? Those being attracting and retaining talent, attracting and retaining valuable customers, innovating and improving on your offerings, uh, while also defending against the innovations of others, and then of course, increase sales and shareholder value. So a lot of folks, you know, kind of get an impression that going purpose driven is really a touchy feely thing. Yep, it's got all that stuff in it, but it is also very powerfully uh, a strategy for addressing these top challenges. And we'll get into how that works in a little bit. So, um, first of all, I want to talk about how much things have been changing lately. So, since 2000, the year 2000, of the 500 companies that were listed on the Fortune 500, uh, 50 percent of those have disappeared. So over the 22 years since that time, we've lost 50 percent of the uh, Fortune 500. And then um, what we're expecting now is in the next 10 years, we're going to lose another 40 percent more of what remains. So 50 years ago, the life expectancy of a Fortune 500 brand was about 75 years. And now it's actually less than 15. So, I mean, take that as a sign that change and innovation is accelerating. So what else are we seeing in terms of acceleration? Um, well, a lot of change in the job market. You know, last year, so that 2021, we had about 48 million people quit their jobs. And it represents about a 60% increase in annual resignations in the United States. So far, uh, in 2022, we've seen um, just over 24 million people stepping out of their jobs. So that trend, that that major increase in the rate of people stepping away from their jobs has increased substantially. Uh, and we're still expecting, uh, well, not expecting, we're seeing about 55% of people who have indicated that they intend to uh, find or change the role that they're in, find a new job or change the role that they're in. That's a lot. So um, just briefly, what are we going to expect here? Um, the reason why I have a montage of the 80s here is just to sort of mentally remind us what the 80s were like. 
because uh, the amount of change that we've seen in the last 40 years is expected to equal the amount of change that we're going to see in the next 10 years. So if you can think about all the ways that your life was different 40 years ago, imagine that much difference occurring again, but just in the next 10 years. Um, this one is just a quick look at like, well, what happens, right? And as, as innovation and change accelerates, the number of years that go by between massive innovations, massive sea changes, et cetera, they become not years, they become like months, basically, where it used to be that you'd expect some kind of a significant game-changing technology to emerge maybe once every 100 years, once every 50 years. Now it's kind of like every page of the, <laughs> of the newspaper that you turn, you're seeing it every day. We'll talk just for a second. What's driving the change? Um, well, yeah, exponential technologies. We looked at those a second ago and unprecedented access. So let's get a little bit more specific about what we mean by exponential technology. These include things like artificial intelligence, uh, genomic editing, blockchain, 3D printing. Uh, but this list could be hundreds of slides long for what we mean by exponential technology. And here we're seeing what we mean by unprecedented access. So there are 4.8 billion people on this planet that currently have access through the internet to the collective intelligence of mankind, any form of talent you could possibly need to accomplish something or to manifest an idea into the world. All the capabilities of production that used to only be available to billion dollar corporations are now available on rent by the hour basis to even a singular individual. So that's anything from uh, machining and tooling to manufacturing and production, they are now available on a rent by the hour basis. Access to audience, obviously, through social media and the internet in general. Access to funding people who have, uh, you know, millions of dollars that want to turn it into tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Pretty easy to find these days. And then uh, a whole new market paradigm for how ideas are presented to the public. So what has that led to? Today... Uh, like right now, the current number, the current count for the number of startups that exist on planet Earth is 305 million. 305 million startup organizations. Uh, certainly all the math that, that applied before about how many businesses fail out of uh, 100, that's all still true. But the number of startups that exist has doubled, has doubled since 2010. So there's going to be a lot of change and disruption ahead. Now let's circle back briefly on the major evolutions of business. Um, and that the chart we looked at a moment ago, that went back some 8,000 years, but we're going to focus uh, on a much narrower band of time. And here we're looking at basically the sequence that people can remember from history class, et cetera, where we started with electrification and then to assembly line manufacturing, telecommunications, robotics, digitization, web 1.0, e-commerce, social media, and then this thing at the bottom, purpose-driven. Well, that seems like an odd duck um, because it's not a technology. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a new invention, if you will, that's going to change um, you know, on the technology side of how business is done. So why does, does purpose-driven belong at this part of this list? And the reason is because when change is happening so rapidly, when new game shifting technologies are coming uh, out of the woodwork, basically on a, on a weekly, daily basis, the innovation that is most important for businesses to undertake in order to survive, and it's definitely the case that each one of these technologies represented um, a choice for business to either adopt or go away. <laughs> um, what we have here is that the, the adoption of purpose-driven or the operationalization of purpose in a company is the next sea change innovation. And it's because purpose-driven companies build a capacity to navigate change, right? So when disruption occurs, when new technologies emerge, when the employment landscape shifts or geopolitical events are unfolding, it's a purpose-driven company that weathers that storm. Because for them, it's not about any one technology or a specific model of business, it's about a vision for what the future could be like. So purpose-driven companies, they, they basically, they chart a voyage um, to, to a future that they have envisioned and they stay that course because they're driven by, they're out there driven by purpose in the, in the way that they approach business. They don't 
fret over the competition or things like that because they're the ones who are busy actually inventing the future that everybody else is terrified is going to um, sweep them away in a tidal wave. I know I've been rampaging through slides, Kirsty. <laughs> Do you have thoughts you want to add? <laughs> no, I think uh, the point is just that we know what people are looking for, right? All these people changing jobs and leaving, they're looking for something more meaningful in the work mm -hmm. that they do every day. And so the quicker companies can really get clear on that, the more likely they are to attract and retain their employees. I absolutely share your thinking on that. I, I think about actually from both sides, I think about it from the, for the employee side and from the consumer side, the employee is looking to bring more meaning into the exchange of their hour for the, for their salary. Um, because there's hundreds, thousands of choices for organizations that an individual can engage with. And, you know, if I have the chance to get salary X here and the same salary X here, but over here I'm exchanging my life energy, that, that hour of my time, day, month, week, whatever you want to say of my time, I'm, a, I'm achieving something more for me personally in that I'm advancing a purpose that I also believe in rather than generating a dollar that I can bring home. You get both. And um, the organizations that are offering both are attracting that talent. And the same thing's happening as I've seen it where consumers are looking to exchange their dollar for a good or a service, I mean, the number of, of ways that people can meet those needs has just exploded, you know, with the, with the internet and the number of businesses that exist. So now it's, it, it, it becomes this added possibility that this exchange can sure get me the service or the product that I'm interested in, but also uh, can support some vision that is meaningful to me. I'm totally aligned with you on that. And this, of course, reinforces that. Um, so why purpose-centered matters? Purpose-centered companies are, and we're going to give you like concrete data on this in a little bit. Purpose-centered are, are better able to attract and retain top talent. Uh, they get a higher degree of customer loyalty, a strength and capacity for innovation. They're able to uh, um, bring disruptive innovations into the market more consistently. They have a decreased potential to be uh, disrupted by others because again, they're out there with a vision of an impact that they want to create in the world rather than any specific technology or product or service that they're aiming they're aiming to to deliver like year after year after year after year it's not a it's not about stocking shelves with dvds every year it's about creating great family entertainment at home right so obviously that targeted at blockbuster but you get the idea um, increasing, uh, increased shares, uh, sorry, sales and shareholder value. And then they're also, um, aligned with the emerging paradigm of business. And those are the two things that we just talked about from the employee standpoint and the consumer standpoint. Um, and then it's, it's greater than the individual, meaning that purpose-centered organizations can do things that individuals aren't able to do in terms of the scope of, uh, vision and impact that they can create upon the world. Thoughts, you know, yeah, I, I just I want to just, you know, the elephant in the room is this whole mm -hmm. idea of quiet quitting, right? That everybody's right? talking about so much. Yes. And the idea is just that we want people who want to be with us, right? So mm -hmm. it, it create it's about creating an organization where people can see how their contributions make a difference on the bottom line but they can also see where the contributions of the organization are lending themselves whether it's to just have a great company where people come and collect and are a part of and get fair wages and good benefits yeah that's a great purpose right that's okay yeah. and not every company is here to save the world but to be clear <laughs> yeah. about it Right. So that our employees want to be a part of that and they can see themselves within it. Mm. That's that addresses this whole issue of quiet quitting. And I, I just I'm fascinated by uh, all the names we've given to things. So, yeah. Great yeah. Point. It, it, the quiet quitting thing is is an extraordinary phenomenon. And um, I, I think, yeah, you, you don't have to peel that onion very far to see what's really behind that. And I, I totally share your thinking. Yeah. Like Eric just poked in on comments and said he cringed when he first heard of quiet quitting uh, it, as a, as a business leader. Yeah. Then that's the last thing any of us want 
and um, we need to be on, on, on alert for it. So, yeah, totally agree. Um, well, actually a little bit later on, we'll have a, a slide that you can see some ways to kind of self gauge, um, whether your organization, like kind of where they're at in terms of operationalizing purpose. Um, so it's, you could think of it as a, maybe a quasi maturity curve. Um, but really I'll give every, I'll, I'll leave the slide up for a while. So you can kind of read through it and, and grade your own paper, if you will. <clears throat> so I just want to talk about kind of where I learned about purpose. Um, so, so I was with a company based out of Cincinnati. It was an outsourcing company. They supported the, the back office of healthcare providers. So that's like hospitals and health systems, clinics, that type of thing. And they, uh, they supported kind of all the non-clinical work that has to get done to get patients to the care that they need and to make sure that uh, the healthcare providers are getting paid for the work that they do. So that interchange between insurance companies and healthcare providers, et cetera. So over the last several decades, um, the processes that exist in American healthcare have become increasingly complicated, uh, and it makes it harder for providers to focus on just, hey, let's provide great care for the patients. Uh, it's more challenging for them to get paid for their work. So companies like the company I was working with, this is Ensemble Health Partners, um, offloaded that work from the providers so they didn't have to spend time more or less fighting to get paid um, and said they can focus on caring for their patients. But what was happening is that these, the staff at Ensemble, they sat in cubes and those cubes were in offices that were based hundreds or even thousands of miles away from uh, the clinics, the physicians, the patients, and the communities that were ultimately being elevated by that work. So um, we undertook a, a an initiative to really operationalize purpose in that company. And part of that initiative was, was communicating back in the impact that was happening for the health systems that Ensemble was supported that ultimately led to uh, better health and even saving lives in the communities that those health systems were operating in. So that was one element of operationalizing purpose at Ensemble. And they did, they did that across many departments and in many functions. And the results were um, very strong. So Ensemble as an organization essentially received every top place, best place um, to work award that there was available in, in their industry, but also in the regions where their offices were located. Their solutions, uh, the solutions that they brought into market were also recognized as the top solutions available in that marketplace. And uh, the impact that they had on the marketplace, just in terms of elevating um, the back office function of healthcare, was also recognized because um, their clients were receiving the industry awards for best revenue cycle performance. So, like every measure that we could think of that would indicate that you're doing really well was hitting top marks on both Indeed and Glassdoor. Um, Ensemble Health Partners was receiving higher ratings than any any of their competitors in that space. I, I think that there are certainly businesses, business sectors that generally have higher ratings, but again, among their competitors, they were the highest rated. And um, in the in the two years that I was uh, with them and that the, these campaigns were underway, uh, 60%, 60% of the full outsourcing contracts that were written in the United States were actually won by Ensemble Health Partners. Um, and they obviously captured a pretty significant part of the market. They they grew from a sixty million dollar valuation to a two billion dollar valuation, and that um, that course took place over just maybe slightly more than twenty four or twenty six months. Uh, massive impact. So, I mean, you would say, did purpose do that? So, purpose played a role. Obviously, there's a, a massive machine underway uh, and a huge amount of effort, but. So you would ask the question, how did purpose support those results? Well, it mattered to the market, to the clients, and to the employees. It helped in decision-making, right? So it set that North Star. It created passion in the organization. It drove innovation. It attracted talent. Uh, it helped us to foster partnerships, not just transactional relationships with uh, Ensemble's clients. And then it aligned the departments. So it, it smoothed out operations um, and inspired people. I mean, all those things definitely contributed to the results that Ensemble was able to post. Amazing, Colt. I, I mean, I think it's easy for us to talk about it, but to show the actual results of it, 
huge. I appreciate you saying that. We have more results to talk about. Um, and you know, the more I research the role that purpose is playing in the organizations that are posting phenomenal results in business, the more it's just evident to me that this is a, this is the next massive sea change innovation in business. Mm -hmm. um, something that does get confused, the the what what purpose driven is not. Um, it's not it's not a thing about just having a purpose statement. Right, something that everybody in the organization can recite that you wrote up on the wall or you have on your letterhead, um, and it's at the top of the fold on your website. That that's great. I I I don't want to deride it, but um, I want to be clear that that a purpose statement doesn't mean you're purpose driven. Operationalizing purpose means you're purpose driven. Um, so that's number one. Number two, again, having corporate social responsibility campaigns is phenomenal. It's really great. Um, donating 2.5% of your profits is powerful, but it's nothing compared to committing 100% of your people, your time, and your resources towards a visionary purpose. It's a, it's a, we're talking about totally different things. Um, and it's not, it doesn't mean you take 100% of what you're doing and you, you have to channel it into your CSR. It means, it means transforming your business into an organization that as a collective of, of people and process and machinery, whatever, is seeking to create some kind of a specific impact on the world. And then again, it's not about anything that you're, you're selling right now. Um, you can, you, we did talk about Blockbuster earlier, right? So Blockbuster was renting rather DVDs, but the business that they were in was the entertainment and home business. If you believe you're in the DVD business, then somebody like Reed Hastings comes along with Netflix that understands what it means to to deliver entertainment at home and leverage whatever's coming as possible in the, in the latest and greatest technologies and then apply that to that purpose. Now, this is a slide I said I'd leave up here. I'm not gonna read this out for you. You guys should read this on your own, but this is what I use at the highest level to give business leaders an opportunity to grade their own paper. You have thoughts you wanna share on this, Christine? Yeah, what I love about this, Colt, is it it also, besides being an assessment, it also gives me a roadmap to the kinds of things that I need to take into account as I'm thinking about, as a business leader, what I want to do within my company. So a lot of times when I'm talking with CEOs and business leaders, they're like, well, our purpose is to just make money, right? We're here to service this customer. Uh. Um, and thinking deeper into it, okay, so why is that, why does it matter to make money, right? Well, we have to pay our employees. Well, why does that matter, right? So really digging in totally, and then using this as a roadmap. So thinking about things like our strategic decisions are guided by our purpose. Mm -hmm. If we use that as the measure of how are we going to make decisions, right? This assessment just gives us all the steps that we need to get there. I love it. Right on. So, you know, if you've kind of done a quick pass through this, grade your paper sort of thing, I would say if you're under 60 or 70 as your total, uh, if you average it all across, um, you may you may want to look into how to uh, advance your organization on the purpose-driven maturity curve. And we'll have some thoughts about how you might be able to do it later on. I think, uh, although it's it's a legend, I don't know if this is an actual story, but it, it comes up often in these conversations. So in 1962, Kennedy, President Kennedy, visited NASA for his first time, his first tour of the facility. Um, and during that tour, he met, encountered a janitor um, carrying a broom down the hallway going the opposite way. And the, so the legend goes, President uh, casually asked the janitor what he did for NASA, and the janitor replied, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. I love this example because it's it's a really compact way to convey what it means to be a truly purpose-driven organization. And that is that everybody within that organization understands the impact that they're seeking to create upon the world. Uh, and they understand the role that they're playing in manifesting that impact. So NASA, therefore, is an organization responsible for one of the greatest accomplishments of our species. <laughs> um, and when a janitor understands his part in that big picture, then I would say that's a really good sign that they're purpose-driven. Sure, all the other things in the evaluation that we looked at a second ago apply, 
But if you needed to fast read on an organization being purpose driven, that would be a really quick way to get you there. So no, we promised some data, some hard number data on um, the power of purpose. And it is powerful. So 78% of consumers would tell others to buy from a purpose driven company and 68% are more willing to share content with the social networks uh, over that of traditional companies. Two, two in three consumers will pay more for products and services from brands that are committed to making a positive social impact. On average, 70% of purpose driven shoppers pay an added premium of 35% more for the products and services that they purchase. Authentic purpose is now an, as important as digital to the next generation of consumers. That's according to Deloitte. Fifty-three <clears throat> percent of sorry of executives at companies with a strong sense of purpose said that they are more successful with innovation, while only nineteen percent report success at companies who have not thought about purpose or companies that have not thought about purpose. Purpose-driven companies had a forty percent higher level of workforce retention than their competitors. Uh, that's again another one from Deloitte. Sixty percent of Americans said last year that they would choose, switch, avoid, or boycott a brand based on its stand on societal issues um, compared to just 47% in 2017. So that sentiment is obviously growing rapidly. And then 70% of executives believe it's important to integrate purpose into their core business functions. Although with that said, only 37% said their op operations are well aligned with purpose. So an understanding of the importance, but obviously a significant, a significant gap in terms of execution. Are we, any thoughts to share? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, so the next slide says it all, right? So when we talked about operationalizing, what does that mean, right? Yeah. What do we have to do? So all of this data is great, Colt, and it tells us why, but the question is what are the things that we have to do yeah. in order to, to get there? Totally. Yeah, my my version of this, I try to just just to give this is like you're just scratching the surface on what it really means. A purpose driven organization, you know, if you think about these as steps, they've co created, co created, meaning that they that they have collectively decided on this being a purpose. And even if you have a core central leader who has a purpose and is dictating it, approaching it as a co creation in terms of the language that they put around it and how they're going to get that done is still is still critically necessary in order for that to truly get operationalized in the company communicating that purpose integrating the purpose into every function of business sharing the stories of that purpose manifesting in the world internally externally tracking and measuring it and then building trust by living that out really personifying um, that that purpose driven mentality and everything that that you do whether a leader or a frontline employee so where does it start right we believe that you have to start with your values right what do you believe in what are the things that you are willing to hold everyone accountable to for what we stand for and what we believe in. Values are the things that we hire people by. They are also the things that we might fire people by. Mm. That's how important that they are as the foundation. From there, right, we create our vision and purpose. What What's the future we want to create? How does that fit together? The mission of what we do, right? And then building out your strategy. How do we, how are we going to do it? And then what are the things that we do? How do we measure success? But it really takes this building of the foundation where we want to start from mm -hmm. to actions and what everyone does. So yeah. I love I love this vision because it just it makes it so clear of all the things that we need to do and how they fit with each other. Yeah, I totally share your thinking on that. And I just want to reinforce this that the getting getting to the collectively shared vision is a significant effort. It's an initiative that takes time. It takes patience. It takes a lot of coordination. Uh, it takes a lot of listening. Uh, there's a lot to it. And it, you, you know, once you've established that, once you've arrived at it, it can feel like a finish line. Really, it is the starting line. The, the true operationalization of purpose in an organization is 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 a long haul effort. Um, and if you want to, to gain the benefits of some of the stats we talked about, that's that's a long haul that you'll have to um, you'll have to complete. So part of this is to understand that operationalizing a visionary purpose is something that occurs across every function of business. Now, when I do uh, purpose-driven workshops, I put a large uh, poster up on the wall 
uh, this is usually like six feet across, that has all these areas on it. And I will hand out post-it notes. This is generally with a leadership team, uh, post-it pads and ask them uh, what they will be doing after, of course, the whole workshop, whatnot, um, what they will be doing or the ideas that they have on how they can operationalize purpose in their organization. And I encourage people to uh, color outside their lane. Um, if, if you're in product management, it should be that you're welcome to contribute ideas to business development, et cetera. Um, and when you go through a process like that, you, a after you've really committed into becoming a purpose-driven organization, there's a, there's a very rewarding outpouring of ideas. Um, and this, this is pretty typical. So you can tell that, um, they, they colored outside their lines, right? Because you see post-its of different colors and different, in different lines. And I think that that's a really, really good sign. Um, and then it's, you do want to go through an exercise of making commitments and setting time boxes and accountability around these things, and then ultimately build your plan to figure out how you're going to go forward. But it is, it, 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 it touches every department. It's company wide. It's an everybody effort. Um, and this is just kind of a serving suggestion for how it can get started. Now, Kirsty, you had asked that we revisit this slide at this point. Um, so I'll, I'll hand this back over to you. Thank you. I, I think part of the difficulty of taking this and making something happen with it, right? What do we do, right? People ask me that all the time. Yeah, Kirsty, this is great. And how do we do that, right? So I want to just show you an example of how you can take what we have outlined here in these six areas mm -hmm. and really bring them to life. I'm going to show you on a platform that we use, but you can do it on an Excel spreadsheet, on a, on a Word document um, to make it come alive within your organization. But I want to share with you sort of how we pull all these pieces together and what it looks like. Let's go to the next slide, Cole. Yes. So thinking about operationalizing, right? So taking it out of being something that we think about, we talk about what are the things that we do, right? sharing client stories, right? How are we impacting them? Integrating it into job descriptions, thinking about how it fits into reviews and KPIs and people's roles, um, adding it to the top of meeting agendas, right? How do we talk about it? That's the storytelling, um, aligning our purpose with vendors and suppliers, all of those things. It's really about taking everything that we do and making sure that it goes through that vision of what our purpose is and why we're even in business. Let's go on to the next slide. So for us, what we think is important is that purpose fits within the top line of everything that you do within your organization. So in this example, we're showing you, this is the company's strategic plan, right? Everyone can see it. Its purpose is right up there with what the vision of who we are is and how are we being, right? Core values, core behaviors. And what you see is a place where it's visual to everyone so that as people are thinking about our strategy, the things that we're doing, our purpose is front and center to everything that we do. So again, going back to those six things, how are we communicating it? How are we integrating it? right? All of those places where you have systems and processes that employees are using. Again, it comes back as a part of what we're showing. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the next slide. When you think about people's goals, rather they're individual goals or team goals, this is how we track and measure, right? So in our example here, um, we have a team working on something and what we can see is how everything is tied back to that strategic plan, which is then tied to the purpose. So as we go in deep, you think about how you set employees up for success. You're clear on what their goals are. You're clear on how you measure success. The more you can bring that piece of things back to your purpose and people can see how it connects right? That's how we continue to integrate it into the work that we're doing. We build trust by giving everyone transparency and the ability to see those things. And we communicate, 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 which 
not for nothing is the thing that I hear the most about um, how hard that is to do within the organization. We use a tool to do that, but again, you can use anything to make sure that you've got those pieces of things outlined with with people, not for them, with them. You know what I really like about this this kind of approach is in, in many organizations who are all, all very well intended, um, you know that that kind of that visibility and the moments when they touch on purpose is something that occurs when you have uh, uh, like a quarterly meeting company wide or yeah if you're making progress monthly for the staff staff meeting or whatever it's going to be um, weekly in the in departmental meetings that type of thing you're getting there this is this is daily hourly even visibility in terms of how the work effort that you're putting forth ties into the initiatives that are um, underway that that are intended to manifest that purpose into the world. So you've really gone to from an infrequent visibility to this is how we're operating, right? I mean, it's such a transformational difference. Yeah, last piece, Cole, let's go on to the next slide. And I, again, um, this is just how we do it, but there, there, Again, you can do this within your organization. So what this is, is uh, the employee has gone in and done the self-evaluation. They've said, here's how I'm doing it, living into our core values, core behaviors. The manager has gone in and said, okay, here's how I think you're doing. So that when they have their one-on-one, -on -one, this again is the communication. They're talking about how are we living into that? And it's got both voices. It's not just the voice of the manager anymore. And uh, when I think about quiet quitting and the great resignation, so much of what we've heard is because people want a voice. And the old command mm -hmm. and control does not work with anyone other than the baby boomers. And we've got four generations after them who are saying, I'm smart. You brought me up to ask questions, to be thoughtful and and let me tell you what I see so that my voice is a part of things. So co-creating, communicating, integrating, sharing stories, tracking and measuring, building trust, all of all of the six of those pieces of things fits in when we listen to what people have to say instead mm. of just telling them what we think. Wow. It's very powerful and it gives everyone the opportunity to feel like they are a part of that purpose because they can see themselves in it. They've got a voice in what we're doing and they can see um, how we're tracking and measuring success. And it's not just by how many widgets we produce. It's also by how we're showing up and who we are being when we are at work. Yeah. You know, so what I would say is that, that a, a conversation about uh, operationalizing purpose in a company is a long one. Um, and in, in the course of this uh, discussion, what we intended to accomplish was to, to increase awareness of kind of the current market circumstance. What, what is happening? Why is it happening? Uh, to, to describe why it is that we believe purpose is the, sort of the next major innovation of business. Uh, and then some of the reasons why purpose is such a valuable initiative to, to pursue, purpose-driven. Uh, and what, what what kind of results you can expect? Um, you know, getting past this into much more detail requires much more time, honestly. So I, I think I would say my hope was that we could at least create this introduction. We could start. Uh, we could support this growing global conversation on on the transition to a new model of business, one that is purpose driven, because I I believe strongly that's where things are going, and I'm passionate that they continue to head in that direction. Um, my my journey, if you will, um, into purpose began here. This is uh, the, the day that I met Judson Ivey. He was the CEO of Ensemble. This was in Chicago. Uh, this is when we worked out the details uh, of my role as uh, chief marketing and communications officer for that company. And it started my journey. I, I, don't, I didn't think of it at that time as I'm going to start a journey into purpose. Um, what, I, what I reflected on once I sort of looked back and saw what had happened and what I had learned and um, the, the understanding that I gained about what purpose can do for a company, I, I recognize this as a key starting point for that journey. Uh, what I'd like to say is I want to encourage you know everybody to lean into the next chapter of purpose with your business, um, the knowledge that you'll gain and uh, the, the capabilities that you're going to build on that path are only going to become more valuable 
in business and in the world. Um, you know, so consider that the the impact your company is going to have in the world is only really just beginning. So I'm I'm grateful to have played some small role perhaps in uh, in that happening for you guys. So I did want to thank you all for letting me be a part of this. And my purpose came when I had the opportunity to start working with entrepreneurs in East Africa. Um, I realized that there was a whole community of people outside of where I lived um, that needed support. And so what you see here is a group of young women entrepreneurs that uh, learned how to write a business plan, how to make sure that their P&Ls actually penciled out so that they could have a viable business to support themselves and their families. And, and so I'd say as important as your business purpose is, I'd encourage all of you to think about what your own personal purpose is. What are the things that make you get out of bed and uh, go into the world as you are? And you can have that in both your business and in the rest of your life. Um, there can be a, a, a beautiful marriage of those things mm. as they come together, as shown by uh, the smiling faces in this wonderful picture. So it is a great picture. <laughs> uh, you can have, you can have those things. Yeah. So we made a promise to, uh, open it up for some questions. I'll just mention before we head there, if folks are interested in further exploring, uh, operationalizing purpose, um, you know, whether it's by method or principle, just introducing the concept to a business, or you, you really want to get it done. You're looking for the tools to support that. When we invite your outreach, we'd love to hear from you. This is this is a topic of passion for both of us. Um, I am on a journey. I want to learn and share everything that I can about purpose. So, I welcome a dialogue of any form. I know that Kirsty does as well. So, you know, please feel free to reach out to us as you you know maybe write down some of these uh, contact details. Would like to do encourage. You know, if you have questions, if there's if there's areas that you want to uh, uh, us to expand into more. I invite you, we invite you to add those to the, to the chat. We're here for the next about 20 minutes um, to, to do that. We really wanted to condense this as much as possible to make time for that, uh, to bring as much value to the audience as possible. Yep, so feel free to use those comments. Otherwise, reach out to Colt and I um, directly. We would We would love the opportunity to talk to you about this. Yeah. And of course, um, the first question is always the hardest one to get to. So let's just skip that one and go to the second question if you were worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, think about this also is um, the questions that you might have, uh, because there's a lot to how to uh, how to get this done would, would very likely be questions that others would have. So, you know, don't be shy uh, if you're thinking about something that you'd like to know more about or a comment that you'd like to share of your own, some thoughts you want to contribute to the conversation, because that's what we're here for as well. So Colt, I will tell you one of the things that I hear often from, from people is just, how do I start, right? What If yeah. I have an organization, how do I start? Yeah. Yeah. So starting is the great first question. Uh, and it does to me have to do with, well, what is the vision that you have for the future? Um, what, what change do you wish to seek to, uh, to create in the, in the world? You can think about I filling in this sentence, I help blank do blank. So that blank would be the first sentence you want to, you want to fill out. Um, and then ultimately where does that lead, right? What is your vision for how the future looks if you take it that far? Um, and then, then you're on your way to creating a, a vision of purpose that you can share. Um, but I, I, what I would also say is it's very important to, to, to co-create that purpose. So aligning with your leadership team, to have them share their values. What what are your personal values? Where do we find intersect? Let's have a discussion where we, we, we present our values to each other and then find where those values are in common and then articulate a vision that can be built on our common values. That's where you really get rich, rich buy-in. Yeah, and a great question to follow up with that, right? From, from someone that's uh, joined us, what tips do you have for involving all depths of the organization in the definition of purpose and the operationalizing of it? I mean, 
it seems like you're the one to take that, but I'm happy to start if you want. I, I mean, I think your answer about the values, right? So for me, it's having those conversations with everyone. What do you yep. appreciate about working here? Yes. What is it that you find makes you want to come and be a part of this team? Mm-hmm. And really listening to how people respond to that yep. um, and, and going deep into the organization. I, I think there's so much uh, wealth of information and thought that we may not even know. Um, and, and honestly, those frontline supervisors, they touch more people than any executive in the organization. They do. They do. And so really listening to what people find value in um, and what kind of an organization that it doesn't mean that you have to be the next Tom's, right? You don't have to give a pair of shoes to everybody, but mm-hmm. Figure out who it is as an organization you are and what you want to be. Yeah. First, Eric, the questions are fantastic. Thank you for contributing to this conversation in this way. Uh, Another thing that I would say about this particular question is it's also important to recognize that each individual has a sense of purpose or an amount of a sense of purpose, right? And opening the dialogue for understanding what the individual's values are, where they find their passions are aligned, what lights them up, helps to do a couple of things. One is that you can, oftentimes you identify roles that a person could be in that would be more aligned with that person's individual purpose as they support the collective, the organizational level vision. That, that, that can yield great results and benefits for doing that. Two is, and sometimes this is the case, that you find there's really not a strong alignment between what this person is passionate about in their life, the kind of change they wish to see occurring in the world. Um, and, and both you as an organization or your, your organization could benefit from maybe saying, I think that you would find uh, a more fulfilling opportunity somewhere else. Yeah, that can, that can sound disruptive for an organization to do that. And it may be challenging to go through a phase like that, but when you really get clear on purpose and you seek to find people who are aligned with it, you get a multiplier effect that is phenomenal. And I, I do encourage organizations to go through that exercise. Mm-hmm. Another great question from Eric. I try to reconcile the quiet quitting with the perception of millennials as having a strong connection to purpose. Can you comment on that in any way? You want to start with that one? Yeah, I, I actually just read something about quiet quitting that that reframed it as not people quitting or, you know, not showing up as much as people just finding that balance in their life. And for me, that goes back to how are we empowering the supervisors and the managers mm-hmm. to make sure that they've given people enough work to do to keep them busy that they're excited about doing, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, honestly... If you know me, you know I say this all the time. We haven't trained managers on how to be a good manager since last century. Like We haven't done that since the year 2000 hit. So we are not doing anybody any favors by not helping managers have the skills that they need to, one, to Colt's point, make sure that we have a good, uh, the right job for the right people that they're energized by that we're giving people the room to make decisions and do things and that we're clear about what success looks like in their job, right? How mm-hmm. do we measure that? If we interview correctly and we are clear about what the job is as we're interviewing, people aren't going to quietly quit because they know why they're here and they know what's expected of them. Yeah. There's a, fu- I think that there's a function, a factor, sorry, of patience that, that goes into this question. Um, I remember uh, in an interview that Simon Sinek was doing, he was talking about interacting with millennials, employees who would come and talk about the jobs that they were in, whether at his company or, or at others. And he would say, hey, how's the job going? It's like, well, I'm actually thinking about quitting. Like, really? Why? It's like, well, I just don't really feel like I'm making an impact. It's like, well, you've been there for six months, man. <laughs> um, so it, it's a sense of like big things take a long time to achieve. Um, so there's that, like, can you, can you help to bring the, 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 the tolerance of time, otherwise known as patience, a, a level up for these people, but you also need to meet them in the middle. And, and the way that you, the, the way that I see that working well is when you consistently 
frequently create visibility of impact that's happening. Um, because I do think that most companies aren't, aren't hitting the frequency level that, that, that really is optimal. Sure, there's an overkill, but I think most companies have a long way to go before they hit that sweet spot of we are internally creating a lot of visibility for a real impact that we're having on the world at an organizational level. And then the, the management structure at the different tiers are doing a good job of helping the individuals in the departments understand how their work and that department is leading to that change, right? So it's uh, at a corporate level, it's the responsibility to, to create the stories and either through video or newsletters or whatever, it's sharing that internally. And then at a departmental level, the managers are, are consistently connecting those dots. Mm -hmm. Question yeah. from John. Oh, spot on. Right on. Uh, in sales, they call it laying down because they know they hit a goal on their management. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or their management doesn't support them and needs and the needs they have to meet customer expectations. This is what you were just talking about, right? So so you've you haven't given them enough to chew on, right? Where it's like right. I I'm I'm my life energy is being exchanged in a very rich way all day long, and that's fulfilling and rewarding, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, all right. Great conversation. Love yeah. all the questions. Yeah, this is like I said, this is about the most fulfilling topic that I, I've, I've been in discussion about lately. So, I mean, I, again, I do invite outreach. I know Christy does as well. I really appreciate everybody being a part of this conversation. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best, right, as you bring these dialogues back. That, um, that assessment form, you can actually find that on scrappyafsolutions.com in the resources section. If you want to get a hold of that assessment, take it into your organization, maybe have that grade your own paper conversation among your leadership team, take a look at it. The consistency of the benefits emerging for businesses that choose to pursue the operationalization of purpose has blown me away. If you do it, it works. That's what I've seen. So um, I want to encourage everybody to really take seriously these conversations in your own companies. Thanks, everyone. Right on, y'all. Thank you.